Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, I am Asif Sheikh, Senior Advisor here at CSIS. Uh, and our future-oriented uh, topic today is Global Priorities for the Sustainable Development Agenda. Uh, I think we're in for a real treat because we have a truly stellar group of speakers, uh, a panel covering a very broad spectrum of developing countries and developing country issues. Now, uh, the unfortunate part is we have very little time. You've all read their bios, you can Google them, and in most cases you can Wikipedia them. So I will just provide the briefest of introductions so we can have maximum time listening to the people uh, that we came here to uh, listen to. After we elicit some opening comments from each of our panelists, uh, I will try to ask one or two provocative questions just to prime the pump, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Q&A. During the Q&A, uh, I ask that each of you who has a question, please make it a question and not a commentary. Uh, and kindly make it 60 seconds or less. I would really hate to have to cut off anyone in such a distinguished audience, but would only do so out of respect for our panel and for those in the audience who have come here to listen to them. Uh, so I think we'll have a wonderful session. And so without further delay, let me introduce our panelists and let me warn in advance that I'm not good at following scripts. So I'll introduce panelists in a certain order, but then I'll ask them to speak in a different order because life is more entertaining that way. <laughs> um, on our far right, we have Dr. Shah, Shah, Shahid Javed Berkey, uh, former vice president of the World Bank and former interim finance minister of Pakistan. Uh, next to him, we have, to, we have Dr. Jean Palem Mathurin, former economic advisor to the Prime Minister of Haiti. And then we have Dr. Uh, Juan Jose Daboub, former managing director of the World Bank Group and former minister of finance of El Salvador. And finally, uh, next to me, we have Ms. Amina J. Muhammad, who is UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on post-2015 planning. So very much focused on the topic that brings us here today. And former Senior Special Assistant to three Ni former Nigerian presidents. So join me in welcoming this extraordinary group of people. And without any further delay, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Dabu to open it up with five or so minutes of remarks, get the ball rolling, and then we'll move along to each of our panelists and then go to questions. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, for attending this session. My global priorities for the Sustainable Development Agenda, it's uh, something that uh, we hear a lot about, and I think it is important to to define properly, to apply in a very executive manner and have the right matrix to actually measure what matters. Many developing countries today have uh, abundant resources uh, and yet, uh, and significant potential, yet because of what we call governance issues, they tend to uh, not perform at some of their peers um, uh, and, and so I like to start with, a, with an example of the Northern Triangle of Central America, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. I am from El Salvador, and so that's very close to home. In the last few months, uh, there has been an orchestrated effort to put together what is called Alianza por el Progreso, or por la Prosperidad, Alliance for Prosperity which has several pillars, including uh, some very important ones on traditional economic goals, objectives, and needs, on the social front, but <coughs> interestingly enough, even if modestly, but on building and strengthening institutional capacity, which, which I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's something uh, to, to recognize. 
So could an effort like this, if it succeeds, be used as an example or as an input uh, for the international development agenda? And I hope that in the next four minutes, plus the Q&A and the conversation from the rest of the members of the panel and the conversation, we can reach some interesting conclusions. I will do it building on three ideas and a constructive criticism here and there. A, demand versus supply-driven uh, development agenda. B, a rather obsolete a spider web of development agencies who are more focused on processes than necessarily on results, which I think uh, uh, should be the actual focus. And third, a short one and a half minute story about my own country, El Salvador, that I think shows how when you have economic and political freedom, you can actually help lift people out of poverty. I come from the private sector, and uh, for 12 years, I was in government in my country, three different administrations without belonging to any political party then or now. And then, as Asif suggested, I was at the World Bank uh, as managing director and responsible for 110 countries, Africa, the Middle East, East Asia, and the Pacific, and Latin America. And one of the conclusions, which shouldn't be earthbreaking, uh, we heard something about this in the previous panel, is that private sector job creation, uh, at least in my view, is one of the best, if not the best tool, to actually provide the dignity and success that people deserve, want, and need. So the number one priority, in my view, for any development agenda should be that one. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things, but uh, I think that when we fall into these 25, 30, 50 uh, uh, goals and objectives, uh, I think we tend to miss the boat precisely for some of the points I will make. So while it is important uh, to build a demand-driven agenda, one cannot ignore the reality of uh, the taxpayers of the countries who are actually contributing uh, 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 from a developed country perspective to provide support to developing countries. And so uh, by the same token, there is often a mismatch between uh, what a country puts as, a priori as priorities and what some of the donors have as a priority. So often uh, this uh, mismatch um, uh, um, you know, represents, a, a, in my view, an opportunity, just like in, in, in markets when, uh, whenever there is a mismatch between supply and demand, someone uh, can uh, benefit from the opportunity that that represents. So how are priorities set today? Well, President X of developing country Y uh, is concerned about roads, water, health, and education, while donor A of country B is concerned about gender, climate change, and inclusiveness. They are all very, very important areas. We all need to work in all of those. They are all about improving people's lives and livelihood. So where is the root of the mismatch? On one hand, um, President X is actually thinking more about the next election than the next generation of his or her citizens. And on the other hand, uh, donor A, many times under pressure from some stakeholders, is subject to budgetary cycles and political interest. And at the same time, the real people, the ones we actually are trying to help, are not necessarily seated at the table. There is usually not represented. And so uh, to make this even a little bit more complex, I talk about the spider web of organizations, uh, the way they are structured, and I'm talking about some of the organizations I have worked for and that are sitting around the table and in the room, um, the way they are set, uh, to my, in my view, debilitates significantly the accountability and the responsibility that many in those organizations have. There are big words like consensus, which of course is important, but that means going at the speed of the slowest. There needs to be a little bit more pragmatism and convergence of ideas 
uh, or of need so that things can move a little bit faster. So how do we address such mismatch of priorities and are the development goals practical and achievable in order to improve people's lives and livelihood? Because I don't think we can argue against them. So here is a short story about my country, El Salvador, which hopefully will start to provide some answers to, to, to the question before us. El Salvador went from hardship to investment grade in a relatively short period of time. For those of you who remember, uh, in the, between 1979 and 1992, 5% of our population was killed. About 22% of our population migrated primarily to the United States. Inflation was on average 30%, unemployment above 12%. The infrastructure of the country, the public infrastructure, 90% of it was totally destroyed, credibility zero. Nobody, uh, for different reasons, will support uh, what uh, uh, the country needed at that time. So after a systematic process of reforms, and you are not going to hear anything different than what actually works in some other countries, where we put a very basic and simple philosophic premise, which was the government should not be an orchestra director but a referee that attempts to resolve the conflicts among the different actors in our society, we were able to reduce poverty from 49% to 19%. Access to electricity, water, and telecommunications went from less than 50% to, in some cases, like telecom, over 150%. And in six years, that's between 1992 that we signed the peace agreements to 1998, El Salvador became investment grade, second only to Chile in Latin America. And guess what? By the year 2000 and 2001 respectively, in those two consecutive years, El Salvador even beat Chile in all of the indicators that are uh, uh, relevant. And I have the Wall Street Journal article here. So uh, how did we do it? As I said before, you are not going to hear something that is not too different from what has worked in Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, Singapore, uh, Korea, uh, or Japan, um, or Chile for that matter. And that is that uh, we opened markets. Uh, we became very disciplined in terms of how to use uh, the resources that people were paying. When I became Minister of Finance, there were 113 different taxes, which of course, to start with, nobody was paying completely, uh, but it was very hard to even control that. So that was reduced to three, and if I would have had more time, I would have uh, ended up with just one, because I, I'm a firm believer of a flat tax. Uh, so fiscal discipline was very important, security was very important, respect for property, private property, and the rule of law, extremely important. Today, these five or six elements uh, continue to be the policies that need to be prioritized on. Not that the other ones are not relevant. It's that, like Maslow's hierarchy, you have to start with those that actually enable the environment for the right investments coming from the private sector primarily to take place. So in my humble opinion, this is where you start earning your position in the global arena, by leading by example. Then, and only then, you can actually take control of your destiny. But you do not actually end up needing too much the international community when you end up taking destiny into your own hands. I'll give you an example. In the years that I was in government, we did not went to development agencies except after the earthquake in 2001 for funding, and we stopped any kind of donors and donations coming to the country. We earned the investment grade and we went to the markets to raise the money. So nobody had an agenda to impose on us. And we actually uh, uh, were able to have the freedom and the creativeness to do the reforms that took El Salvador from hardship uh, to investment grade. Having said all of this, the example of El Salvador, however, is turning out into a sad story today after two consecutive populist governments, we are almost back to square one. We have orchestra directors rather than referees. 
uh, the institutions have been captured to execute a political agenda following an ideology that has proven to fail in North Korea, in Cuba, or in Venezuela. So would that be the demand-driven development agenda to be supported? Is that the governance model that works? Poverty is back at about 50%, growth is less than 2%, and regrettably, instead of competing against countries like Chile or some of the more advanced countries, we are fighting the first place for criminal rates in our country today. So this chapter, because it is a chapter that we will overcome, I'm sure of, because Salvadorians are very resilient, gives us two lessons. One, it is better to have an imperfect market than a perfect bureaucrat telling us what to do. And the second lesson is that once you start in a process of alleviating poverty, which takes about one generation, uh, you have to lock in the benefits of such path of progress by having the right institutions in place that increase governance, that minimize or eliminate corruption, and that actually empowers people so that they can take destiny into their own hands. So the development goals should not be goals per se, but instruments that take us uh, to, 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 to removing the obstacles that allow people to actually succeed. So good governance, institution that work can keep the momentum going. One final comment, and I will be within the six minutes that you gave us, uh, is that how is it that a beautiful and a great country like the United States, in spite of the current, let me be politically correct here, weak leadership, continues to lead the world? Two reasons. A, a justice system that works, and B, enough freedom for people to innovate and create. So and these are the two elements where I will focus my energies when talking about all of the different, whether MDGs or SDGs, uh, because this is what can, at the end, take us to the, what I said earlier, to me is the key element for development, which is, and should be our number one priority, private sector job creation. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to jump as far geographically across the world as I can, and that would mean it would be Challenge Berkey, uh, although geographically you have both been in Washington at the World Bank, but uh, you bring a lens from Pakistan uh, with your vast experience also in uh, places like China and Latin America. I wonder if you would sh share your thoughts with us. Well, thank you, Asif. Uh, I have a slightly different take on the topic that we are discussing today. Uh, I'll make a probably a <clears throat> provocative statement. I'd say that since the subject of this particular forum is sustainable development, my view is that we are in a situation where that particular objective cannot be met. So I am not going to talk about specific countries. I'm just going to talk about, for a very brief period, uh, the way I see how the global economy is emerging and how the global institutions are not developing in a way that they can <clears throat> handle the challenges of the global economy. If uh, I have an interest, it would be in economic history. And when you look back uh, to 1944, uh, you see that globally, that economically and financially, the world was in turmoil. But few people meeting at Bretton Woods were able to put together a system which worked and worked very well because of three factors. One, there was one country, the United States, which was prepared to provide leadership for the new system, had the resources uh, to be able to do so. Second, the genius of the people assembled at uh, Bretton Woods was that they were able to create at least two of the three institutions they had planned all along uh, as they were preparing for this session uh, in a way that they 
these institutions worked very well for decades. And here I'm talking about the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which was initially called the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The third institution, World Trade Center, took another 40, 50 years to create because trade, as we know from politics in the United States, is always a very difficult subject to uh, get, uh, get your uh, <clears throat> arms around. That system worked until about 1991. Uh, the only challenge to the system was an ideological challenge. And this uh, involved developing countries with the West on one side and the socialist countries on the other. And it was, there was an ideological confrontation which of the two systems uh, should be favored by the developing world, which was then in a state of flux. Uh, suddenly, European communism collapsed. Uh, Ru Soviet Union became Russia. There were a bunch of uh, independent states. And uh, uh, my friend Francis Fukuyama went to the extent of saying that that was the end of history, uh, that there was going to be only one ideology, one system, and one set of institutions supporting it. And that kind of thinking uh, led to uh, the development of uh, ideas on the management of the global economy, among them uh, something that came to be called the Washington <coughs> Consensus. Uh, my friend over here talked a lot about the private sector. Washington Consensus had three issues. Uh, tremendous role to the private sector. State will step back and not provide, uh, <clears throat> not interfere with the working of the private sector. Doug, just a little bit of uh, light regulation. The second was that there will be uh, a lot of uh, back and forth uh, a flow of uh, ideas, goods, commodities between different countries. This was the globalization phase. And, and, the, and the third idea was that democracy uh, was the only uh, system that should be put in place. Democracy is the only system <laughs> that can give sustainable growth. So in Washington consensus, the democracy, private sector, and uh, relationships between different countries became uh, the guiding uh, attributes. But now, today, things are very different. Uh, my view is that today we are faced with a situation which is almost as difficult, as much in a state of flux as was the situation at the end of the Second World War. What has happened? What has happened is four or five things. Let me list them very quickly. Uh, there is uh, <coughs> uh, IMF decided two or three months ago, not decided, worked out, that China had become the largest world economy estimating their GDP on the basis of purchasing power parity. So the United States has lost its, uh, 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 its role as the premier economy of the world. The second uh, is the enormous amount of accumulation of savings in a few countries, China, Germany, Korea, uh, to a certain extent, Japan, and no institutions which are able to uh, intermediate between those who save and those who need uh, these savings for investment. Third, uh, there is a changing nature of demand uh, in the developing countries. In 1944, when World Bank and other institutions were created, uh, the problem was simple. These countries didn't have the savings, they didn't have the capital. To, to develop them or to have them emerge out of uh, 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 difficulties that they had experienced during the war, capital was needed. But now, the situation is different. Uh, the most uh, important, the most difficult thing that these countries have to do is to find the ways to create infrastructure which would make sustainable development possible. And that is not going to happen by these countries themselves, it's going to happen by the transfer of resources from the big savers to what would be big spenders, and uh, you need a new set of institutions. 
The third is, uh, uh, some people say, uh, although I don't fully buy this, that the United States has lost the political will to provide leadership. And that's happened because there's enormous confrontation between two political parties in the states with two very different ideologies. And because of that, nothing much is happening in terms of developing uh, an institution structure that can come to the rescue of the global economy, which is now faced with some very serious problems, which is why China has taken some initiatives, uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIB, which the United States resisted but was not able to prevent from uh, other countries to join. This is one manifestation of the changing structure uh, institution structure that we are going to see in the next few years. So I'll conclude by making the following observation. I would say that unless there is political will uh, exercised by all major countries, all large countries of the type that was uh, exercised in 1944 at Bretton Woods, we are not going to be able to produce sustainable development in the global economy. We will have frictions, we will have tensions, we will have conflicts, and uh, they, will, they will be costly, and they will set us back uh, from, uh, the, from achieving what I consider to be uh, the potential of these countries. Some economists uh, have coined a phrase, uh, Larry Summers talks about uh, secular decline, uh, his, uh, uh, his notion that uh, the, <clears throat> the period when uh, there was secular increase in uh, GDP all over the world has uh, ended, and now we are, we are faced with a situation where uh, GDP rates of growth are not going to reach anywhere near the levels of, uh, uh, of the past is something that we have to live with. And one final point, uh, economists have really not factored in demographic considerations into their models mm -hmm. and into their thinking. We are seeing a fundamental change, a fundamental demographic change, uh, which is going to affect all parts of the world. Europe is declining, population is declining. Uh, China has now begun to see a decline in its population. The Arab countries, the Muslim countries uh, continue to grow. They have the youngest populations anywhere in the world. And the United States is the only country in the developed part of the world which still has a positive rate of growth of GDP. So this uh, also needs to be factored in when we think about the future. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. <coughs> I think we have an extremely vigorous discussion uh, going here, and it'll be fascinating during the Q&A. Um, since I lived in Nigeria, and I started my career at the United Nations, I would like to save you, Ms. Mahmoud, for the last, no. and move to Dr. Maturin uh, for, from Haiti. And uh, Haiti has some unique challenges and you've looked at them through the eyes of both the public sector and the people of Haiti. And I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts on what you've heard and what you've experienced. Thank you, Asif. Uh, thank you to Dan and to CSIS for inviting me to uh, participate at this uh, very important session where the uh, topic is, uh, is a very critical one for the world that we are living in, and more importantly for uh, a country like Haiti, uh, which suffers a lot, not only from the history, but also from the modern nature uh, over the last couple of years, and we continue to survive. And we hope that we can make better than surviving. We can imagine ways of uh, coming out of this uh, difficult uh, path and building the future uh, more aggressively, but more positively also. Um, Haiti in that uh, topic is a very particular case. We are uh, the only less developing country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, we have uh, the youngest population. Uh, more than 65% of the Haitians are under 45 years old. 
uh, 44% of them uh, has less than 18 years. Uh, they call that in Haiti a kind of uh, tsunami because at any moment, if nothing changed, uh, with uh, such a population, uh, social chaos can happen. Uh, it happened that uh, this country that has made history for being the first uh, black uh, republic in the world, first group of slaves that has fought uh, the whole uh, international system at that time uh, to become independent and to show to the world that there is other ways of cooperating and to show to the world that there is a possibility of stopping uh, human slavery. So this country has paid that very, very hard. Now, um, this country has also, uh, still has a lot of opportunities. In the past, this country used to be uh, the first uh, or the richest uh, country uh, to serve the French kingdom. And now it is the poorest one. But despite that, Haiti, where it is located, is a critical, very critical point in the whole Caribbean because it is located in the middle of the two Americas and just uh, 60 miles away <coughs> from the northern Haiti, you have the, the most important road for the world trade. Uh, Haiti has uh, some critical resources uh, uh, mineral resources. Uh, in Haiti, every kind of uh, uh, every kind of um, agricultural uh, goods can be produced. Um, Haiti has also uh, a, a big and growing population. Uh, we are more than 12 million on the on, on the on the part of uh, that island. But we have also close to five million Haitians living in the diaspora. Uh, Haiti has a critical set of challenges because of political instability, because of poverty, uh, because of um, vulnerability of the environment that justify a big interest for Haiti uh, when the international world uh, is thinking about uh, you know, sustainable development, inclusion, uh, income, uh, uh, reduction of income inequality, etc. So my understanding after uh, many years working uh, as a consultant for the international agencies, uh, but also as a, a former economist advisor to many prime ministers, uh, but also as, a, as an entrepreneur, uh, realized that uh, in, at that point of, the, of history, Haiti will need to look at maybe four basic conditions to restructure uh, uh, its society and its economy um, uh, in order to, to link itself to the world that, that is moving. Uh, first thing is, it's very basic. Uh, Haiti needs to have legitimate authorities that, uh, are, um, that are um, designated by its population and more freely uh, so that these people can carry uh, the, uh, the goals of, uh, of the nation. Uh, second issue is that this, the fact that uh, the people can give legitimacy, legitimacy through uh, uh, democratic election, put a bracket around democratic election. Um, uh, this, uh, this legitimate leaders should take into account uh, the uh, set of uh, what the so-called uh, stakeholders that this country uh, uh, has, uh, so that they can build trust among the poorest and the richest because in this country, the, the divide is very big between very few people which hold significant uh, portion of wealth and very and a large portion of population that has nothing. 
So we need to uh, bring them closer. Or to get them closer, they need to work together. The third condition is the relationship between Haiti and the international world and the international partners. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Dabut was uh, talking some minutes ago about the uh, differential between the goals, between the national interest and what the uh, international partners consider as a priority. So this is something that needs to be looked at. And the fourth condition is related to history, with the Haitian traditions, with the Haitian uh, culture, with the Haitian identity, which is a bit different inside the whole Caribbean. So based on that, we think that from that kind of legitimate leadership that can link the international uh, and the local interest uh, in the perspective of serving uh, for the betterment of whole Haitians, uh, we think that uh, there is now uh, a need to increase uh, uh, the, the wealth that can be produced inside of this country because this country, for long, uh, the philosophy uh, was that uh, it was not too good to be rich. And I think we cannot move out of poverty without increasing the wealth that can be produced in, this, uh, in such country. So to get that done, I think there is uh, uh, four uh, major reforms that need to take place. So the first one is a set of uh, 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 reform that can modernize uh, the whole way of doing things in this country, whole way of doing business in this country to get the state fixed, but also to build trust uh, uh, into uh, the society. And the second will, will come with a set of uh, uh, decentralization process, because today this country is very concentrated around Port-au-Prince. So we will need to bring uh, the whole decentralization process so that instead of people to come to the state, now the, the state and the services will have to move to the people in the other part of the country. We have lost so many lives uh, during the earthquake because the critical services were all concentrated in Port-au-Prince. So people were coming everywhere to come to Port-au-Prince. So now we need to uh, uh, make the other way. So to get that done, uh, the critical uh, uh, support will be the infrastructures. And for getting such infrastructure, infrastructures uh, in place, uh, the state doesn't have to control everything. But the, the state has to uh, make infrastructures a priority and uh, the, the, the type of infrastructure that can boost the growth and uh, push Haiti to that century. And the last uh, uh, dimension is uh, the security and, uh, and the, uh, the justice system. Uh, today, uh, without uh, a judiciary system that works, uh, that can uh, make people feel confident and safe, uh, with respect of uh, property rights, with uh, uh, less impunity, et cetera, it may be very difficult to get this, this country on its, on its way. And so uh, today, in this uh, uh, reflection on how to build a more sustainable uh, world uh, in, in Haiti, we think that it cannot be done without inclusion. And how to include people uh, in such a country? I think there is a set of uh, public policy uh, and a set of incentives that should be put together. Uh, the public policies will, should target to um, education and, uh, and professional training, because this very young population need to be in condition to, uh, to move forward based on their uh, on their skills, and I can tell you without education, I won't be able to be sitting here with you, uh, given the fact that from a very, very uh, uh, poor family, uh, without that unique opportunity, I won't be able to make it. And I think there is many Haitians that uh, would be very helpful for the country uh, if they have that same opportunity too. Uh, second is uh, a very significant uh, boost in job creation uh, and an equal chance for women, because there is much more women in Haiti than men. 
So it needs to be uh, 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 the same thing too. Uh, the third uh, dimension is uh, the possibility uh, for Haiti to be able to talk on its own. Uh, it happened that many people tried to talk on behalf of Haiti, but they don't know what really Haiti means and how uh, Haitians could organize themselves to meet what they need. So in this uh, process of uh, reshaping uh, uh, the way that uh, people are interacting in the world, and they need to have it made in, in a sustainable way, I think a uh, country like Haiti uh, should be used again as a model if they give a chance to this country to take on itself uh, its destiny. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Mohammed, you are focused directly on the sustainable development agenda and what you do, and you have perspectives from Africa's largest economy, and many would say the most important country in Africa. Uh, would you close out this session for us mm -hmm. with your comments on anything you've heard and anything you would like to discuss? Great, thank you very much, and hello everyone. Um, I actually think we're at a really exciting point in time in history, and, and our colleague just talked about going back in history, and I think we've come to a watershed moment where the United Nations at 70 created itself around the whole peace agenda, never to go back to war in 1945. But what it has that's so much more important this year is that it wants to change the narrative for development, that we want to talk about the lessons learned and how we deal with sustainable development in a, re in a real way that has the resources to accomplish that, um, but that also really looks at climate change being a part of it and not as a separate conversation. So it is, I think, an agenda that we've set. We've spent the last two and a half years, three years, discussing how we're going to shape this. Um, and it is exciting. It is a political agenda. So for those that are looking for the science in it, um, that'll happen when we come to implementation, but it's aspirational because it's a response to the extremely complex challenges um, that we have today, where we're dealing with migration, we're dealing with youth cohort that we've never had before, and a lack of jobs, exclusion, inequality that is increasing, uh, conflicts that we really don't even begin to understand um, as they emerge um, every day. But we've also got this incredible opportunity for transformation, and that's really what the Sustainable Development Agenda speaks to. Now, whether that will happen or not is if we try, will, will depend on if we try to change that narrative. A narrative that says that this agenda is universal, it's about every one of us in this room, outside of the room, it's about leaving no one behind. It's about investing not in a piece of us or a reduction of poverty, but of the whole not in just a social agenda, but actually an economy that grows and makes a difference and has results in people's lives and tries to protect our planet. And so it is very much a universal agenda. We will hear different things that we've never heard before. We have in the last two and a half years where we say universal, and what Latin America has to say about development is different from what Africa has to say about it, and a different perspective from Europe, from the islands, from Southeast Asia. Everyone has a different take on what their priorities are, but ultimately, it is about our human well-being. It is about peace, um, and it is about development. And I think that that makes it even more exciting when we think about how do we do this in an integrated way? How do we really make sure that we're not siloing the issues because they reflect what our individual interests are without really considering the collective for which we all know today, this global village, this global family, what one does will affect the other. And I think that's the biggest wake up call that we've got to try to respond to that. Um, the make or break of this will be of course about how we implement it. And I think that's a really important question that we're now grappling with because in the United Nations, the die is cast with the number of goals that we have, and they are basically the, the substance of what we think should be invested in going forward over 15 years, 17 of them that cover the social agenda, our economic and environmental agendas. Um, and when we think about how we're going to implement this, we have to think 
from the lessons we've learned of the Millennium Development Goals that did succeed. Um, they succeeded so much so that we're talking about the next set of goals, but they are unfinished business. And this new agenda actually help, tries to help carry them through so we know we have a transition, not that we wake up in January 2016 and start a new agenda, but there is a transition for this one. And that means I think we have to think very thoroughly about how we're going to be fit for purpose. Fit for purpose in the United Nations to help facilitate this discussion, this implementation um, at the country level, because ultimately it is countries that have to be in the driver's seat. It's countries that have to determine that destination. We've learned that the MDGs, one of the failures was that it was too much of a prescription. So this time, 193 member states determining what happens to them at the country level is, is a difficult one. So how does the United Nations themselves become more fit for purpose for this? But how do governments do that? How does civil society do that? How does business do that? The new people that we have coming into this, how do parliamentarians address this? Um, how do you in this room, academics, everyone that has a role to play, um, actually begin to respond to what we're asking for? And, and at the scale at which we need to do it. And that therefore brings me to the whole discussion around the importance of institutions. And it is the one different thing that has happened in the sustainable development agenda beyond everything else. We've talked about lots of economic issues, social issues and environmental issues separately, never brought them together. But what is the glue that will make this hang together? Will be that environment that needs to deliver it. It will be about strong institutions the capacities that we need, investing in the human capacity, the assets that we have um, to do that. And that really is starting from different bases in different places. Um, and where many countries that have shown to succeed over time, it has been because they've invested in institutions. And it's a difficult thing to do. So for us to find that we have um, a goal that focuses on institutions, the rule of law, um, and peace is an incredibly important part of how does this fit? How do we translate this? Um, and, and what do we do to make it work? It's not an attractive spend. Anyone that has been in government and anywhere near a minister of finance knows that the last thing you want to invest in is an institution because you've got four years to deliver the dividends of democracy, and that's not an attractive, um, I can touch and feel this and show it to my people so I get reelected. Um, it's a long-term investment, and I think this is where we will um, struggle to see how uh, we can do that. The fact it's on a global agenda means a lot um, to what happens at the local level, um, that the importance of it for us to have, for instance, um, services that work. We all know that from the last um, terrible tragedies of the Ebola crisis in West Africa, that what we didn't do, we failed to invest in systems in institutions, in people. So when that crisis came, we were not able to respond. Um, and I think this was a, a very big lesson for us. When we looked three years ago to see what we needed to do to accelerate on the MDGs, we woke up to the shock that the majority of children coming out of school didn't have a quality education. They could not read or write. What had we done to that generation? Because you can't ask them coming out of a school with a certificate that they're not educated and they need to go back. So in many cases, the systems did not deliver on really what we uh, thought would empower um, to, to allow us um, uh, to move forward on the human development agenda. And that, I think, um, is uh, a big cause for us to think, how do we deal with that? And where are we going to get the resources to do this, having, um, knowing that it is, it is not the most attractive of investments? One of the discussions we've had is that we are, many developing countries, put in a situation where a minister of finance will have a budget that they have to balance, a budget that is really basically choiceless choices, because you're asked to spend on health or education or water and sanitation, or the big ticket items of infrastructure that are supposed to develop your country, increase your domestic resource mobilization so that you can actually do the both. But it's either or. So now we do have to find the means of implementation to say both need to be done. And when we look to the global partnership, it is that, yes, we know that overseas development assistance for the sustainable development agenda is a critical political commitment, but it's insufficient to do what we need to do if we have to deliver on this agenda. And unlocking the resources that are available, that do exist, 
that come into this agenda is what we need. How do we get resources to pay for big ticket items so we can grow our economies to take care of the services and the, the institutions that need to deliver on them? And I think that this is going to be a litmus test for you know, how can we do that? How do we invest in our young people? It's certainly not an option uh, that I believe that we have. Um, I've got six children and so I know every day they are looking to how they can engage with helping grow our country, Nigeria, that's just new dawn. We have a change in government. We have to sit back, step back, reflect about where we want to go, um, take really the destiny of Nigeria in our hands. And as my colleague from Haiti says, you know, this is not about being driven in a direction that other people think are right for you because they have determined a set of measures that put you in a certain place. It is about a country reflecting on who they are and, and what they want to be and where they want to go. Um, and the while things are urgent, that they're not going to be in a hurry to fail. So step by step, they will make concrete um, moves towards that goal. Um, it is a time for us to reconcile. There are many, many issues in this world today that have put us in a position of conflict. And I think that the reconciliation of those issues within countries, across borders, is something we need to discuss because so much so, uh, institutions are being built around symptoms rather than to deal with the root causes of what we have to um, build back. And we will have to look at how we rebuild nations that don't have the necessary skill sets. And so, you know, how does migration not become forced, actually become one that is planned, actually has one where the forced have a reason to remain behind and not to have to, to, to go across borders. So I think this is some of the, the challenges that we will have as we go ahead. It is really, for me, about the implementation, um, the will to put institutions back to work again. It's not as though they were not working. In many countries, it is a neglect of it because there were other priorities in the way in which we um, adopted in a development, um, a development agenda. Um, September comes and we will gavel a new agenda, and I'm very confident that the United Nations will be able to do that with the partners in the 193 countries that we have. I think the concern still remains in the next few months whether we will have the appetite and the political leadership to get that ambition to match the complex challenges that we have today. And a lot of that will have to do with the means of implementation, with how we deal with um, coming together to say, yes, this is worth it, uh, there is the implications for not having it done, um, don't bear thinking about, nor can we visit that on the next, next generation, and that we get behind it um, to do so. Thank you very, very much to all of our panelists. I sense that there are probably some pent-up questions in the room. Uh, we started late, uh, so we'll take, say, three questions. Uh, uh, the first hand I saw go up is the woman in the back. And then uh, over here, uh, I guess the, it, that was the hand that went up first. Yes, yes, sir. And then uh, the person there. So the three of you in that order. OK. Uh, and then we'll put the questions to the panel. Hi, I'm Sharon Ten. I work for the International Partnership for Microbicides. We develop HIV prevention products for women. Um, there was a little bit of mention about women, and I wanted to hear from all of you about the role of women in the Sustainable Development Goals, and in particular, issues of gender equality um, in both the developed countries and the developing countries. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I believe, was, uh, uh, I, I believe your hand was up first. I apologize, sir. I'm Bob Hershey. I'm a consultant. Uh, to what extent are you able to use the internet to get some transparency in this and try and get an economic consensus of what people want to do? Thank you. And the third question was the woman in the black and white. I'm Myra Addis, and I'm a professor of uh, the progress in integral development in Catholic University. And my question is for the lady in the UN um, about what is the UN doing in terms of sustaining peace, just going beyond um, nice objectives of environment, access to water, electricity, when uh, 
the globe is turning into when you see certain governments that are very violent and they're growing in Central America and uh, some of them came through democratic elections like in Venezuela. Uh, what is the United Nations going to do about uh, sustaining peace when uh, violence is increasing? Uh, and there's not much time to think about uh, education and other things. Thank you. Uh, I'll ask the members of the panel to uh, respond as they would. Ms. Muhammad, do you want to start with the one addressed directly to you or let others Yeah, uh, I, can, I can start. Um, I mean, I think all three are really important questions and, and thank you for that. I think that the, the peace agenda, as I said, you know, as the UN looks at itself at 70 and reflects on that it was set up to keep peace and, and to be about, about um, you know, nations that lived with um, peace, development, and prosperity. Those are the three pillars that hold us up. But we're challenged by that peace agenda. We're challenged by the human rights agenda. Um, and as we have started to shape the sustainable development agenda, one of those questions that we've been asking is that this is actually a response to it. So it's not about um, what are we going to do, keep the peace beyond the nice things we do? Actually, if we had done more about investing in the nice things, we would have so much more peace. And that's what we haven't done. We've done insufficient development uh, to prevent the conflicts, to prevent the exclusion, to prevent the inequalities, such that we now have many stages of conflict. Even in the time that we've shaped this agenda, we've had more conflict. And then when we've been lucky enough to have governments and people come together to make peace in some countries, then we have not invested in the dividends of peace. The day after has been insufficient development in rebuilding institutions, in rebuilding communities, in giving them what they need. And this is about, not about the United Nations not putting that forward, it's about the political leadership of governments to make those investments that are needed. In countries that are too weak and too fragile, the partnerships of the global community where we have committed to do this, we have failed to. And I think that there's serious reflection that needs to happen as the sustainable development agenda comes, not to see it as something that is so aspirational and perhaps too big, but without it, we will not maintain peace and we will not address the issue of human rights. I think with women, they are absolutely central to this agenda. Not only are they a goal, but they are cross-cutting inequality, access to justice, uh, to our own health, to education, much more especially that we really speak about women in decision making and leadership. Not just leadership, not just the numbers, but in decision making. And so I, I think that is something that is embedded in, and in the SDGs and we hope that we will get that into a good set of indicators that help us measure it. Um, and then last but not least, at least the United Nations using the internet uh, to connect with young people, social media, the My World surveys, which we asked, what is the world that you want and received um, over, I think it's eight million now, responses to that has been quite incredible way of, of, of um, um, reaching out. But I have to say that it's also helped in my country, the fact that we have the internet and social media actually put transparency on the elections themselves. That we were able to see second by second what was happening and even the head of the government call some of those results even though we know the independent electoral commission had the final say. So I think you know, this has provided an, an incredible opportunity for transparency. It's actually reduced corruption in elections where um, instead of becoming elect selections, they have now become much more about elections. Thank you. I see that Javed Berkey uh, has a <coughs> comment to add. Please. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up uh, this issue about gender equality and uh, what's happening in, in that area, what the states can do and so forth. Uh, this issue uh, is extremely important in the world of Islam at this point. Uh, but I think it's use, useful not to look at Muslim countries as uh, being the same set of countries across the globe. You can divide the world of Islam into three parts. Uh, there is the Arab countries plus some countries in Africa which have a very conservative uh, outlook on the role of women uh, in all aspects of life. Then you have the countries in the central part of the Islamic world this is Turkey, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and so on, where women's role is uh, more liberally accepted. And then you have 
the countries in, e in the East, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so forth. Uh, I know the situation in my own country, Pakistan, very well. And it's really not realized outside Pakistan because Pakistan gets very bad press for a variety of reasons as to the very important roles that women have begun to play in that country. Uh, I do some work in Singapore every year, and I once asked uh, a research assistant of mine who happens to be from Bangladesh to tap into the data assembled at Harvard University about education in South Asia. And I was very surprised to see that Pakistani girls and Pakistani young women were doing better than Indian young women, Indian girls, and Bangladeshi young women and Bangladeshi girls. And that was happening for two reasons. One was the enormously important role the private sector has now begun to play in Pakistan. It, private sector uh, educational system is run by women, managed by women, and in those schools, women are in majority. In most professional schools, even engineering schools in Pakistan, women are now about 55% to 45% for men. I was looking the other day at the entrance of newcomers into the workforce. Pakistan receives about a million people every year into the workforce, of which about slightly more than half are women, and they are better trained than men. Consequently, they are moving into some very important sectors of the economy banking, education, health, entertainment, IT sector, and so on. Uh, and this is a, a kind of a, a thing that has happened on its own. State didn't encourage it. Even uh, the multilateral institutions didn't pay as much attention to this as possible. This was a movement that was led by women, some uh, because of commercial reasons, some because education is the only thing they see which is available to them in order to advance in the society. So I think uh, it is important when you think about uh, gender equality uh, to look at different situations in different parts of the world because dynamics uh, work in different ways. Thank you very much. Uh, if any of the other panelists, we have only about a minute and a half left, so we won't be able to take any more questions. But if any other panelists want to comment on the questions already asked. No, I think um, the uh, issue on uh, uh, gender is a critical one in the Haitian uh, situation, the Haitian context, because we have uh, close to 52% of the population which are women. Uh, most of the uh, investment done in the uh, education of the uh, Haitian population has been made by women. It happened that uh, the, equality, the inequality is very high. So it's a serious challenge to, uh, to include now, uh, and by many uh, innovative ways, uh, the women uh, uh, so that they can take the, uh, the proper leadership uh, in, uh, in running also the country. Uh, it's a big fight. And I think in that way, um, the global partners uh, have to uh, support, uh, mainly in, uh, in helping Haiti to, uh, to fund the basic uh, uh, conditions to uh, empower the women. Uh, in education, uh, it's a critical one. Uh, training in most of the professional fields, that's another one, uh, in getting them uh, credit uh, to run their business, uh, because most of them has the uh, responsibility of the family. So they will need to be empowered in that, in that way to be able to continue to, uh, to make uh, the change in the society. Um, the salary, uh, the different, the, the, uh, the inequality in terms of salary is also a major issue in Haiti today between women and men. Uh, I think the society needs to change so that we can be, uh, we can match 
that requirement. I think it should be put on the top of the agenda that uh, that uh, uh, that has that has to have to happen. Uh, another another thing that come to my mind is that uh, very often uh, we have we have to choose. And uh, when it comes to choose, uh, the society call on the women, and we remember all the good things that the women bring. And when times come to share, very often they forget the women. So I think uh, in the whole transformational change that needs to take place in my country, uh, we will need to not forget that time, that they take uh, into account the women in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I know Amina Muhammad wanted a 30 second comment to close and that sounds like an excellent way to close, so please. Okay, I don't usually talk about religion, but as a Muslim woman, what I would say when it comes to gender equality, the gender challenges that we have, that in the Muslim world, it is actually our men in Islam that are the challenge and not Islam. The, the, the religion itself, when the prophet was asked who was the most important, he said, your mother, your mother, your mother, and then your father. And I think we need to underscore that because it is not the religion that prevents us going to school. Even when we go to school, we can still remain in the home if the man says so. So it is the man in Islam and not Islam that is the major challenge. Done. Except. <laughs>